Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to hold on just a few seconds while our platform is letting everyone in. In the meantime, we would love to hear from you in the chat. You can say hello, give us a greeting, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. We would love to hear from you. Hello, hello, welcome. Hi, everyone. I see our numbers growing. Um, I'm just going to give it a few more seconds here while our platform is letting everyone in, but then we will get started shortly. Welcome. And yes, feel free to let us know where you're tuning in from. I love seeing all of these messages in the chat. We will go ahead and get started here today. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Gender Identity Support from Exploration to Transition. My name is Jackie Zimmerman. I'm the Public Education Associate at Mental Health America's National Office, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Just a few notes before I introduce our presenters. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within one week. We currently do not offer CEUs, but if you would like a certificate of attendance, feel free to request one. I will put that link to do so in the chat, and that will also come in follow-up materials along with the recording. Today's webinar is going to be panel style, so we have quite a few discussion questions to get through, but if we do have time, we are accepting other questions from the audience through Q&A style. As we're going, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. We would love to give you an answer. And as time allows at the end, we can go through a few of those as well. Also feel free to um, add any comments or additional knowledge that you all have in the chat. I know we always have some really great, amazing participants here that um, have a wealth of knowledge and we would love to hear from you as well. So feel free to add those comments in. And now I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today, Barry Eisenberg and Peter Bailey. Dr. Barry Eisenberg is an internal medicine provider with the Sutter Health Affiliated Palo Alto Foundation Medical Group and co-director of Sutter Health's Comprehensive Gender Care Program, which serves healthcare needs specific to gender diversity. Dr. Eisenberg has more than 35 years of experience in medicine and focuses on LGBTQI plus and transgender healthcare. He graduated from the University of Rochester School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you, it's great to be here. Awesome. We also today with us have Dr. Peter Bailey. Dr. Peter Bailey is a queer trans man who has worked at Sutter Health for six years as an occupational therapist in inpatient psychiatry. He's a member of Sutter's Culture Change Committee, the Network's Reduction of Seclusion and Restraint Committee, and has supported the Comprehensive Gender Care Program. Peter is also a professor at San Jose State University's Occupational Therapy Master of Science Program. Let's jump right into it. So Barry and Peter, what does the topic of today mean to each of you? Okay, I'll go first. I'll take that one. Um, so thank you, uh, Jackie. Um, so as Jackie mentioned, I, I am an uh, internal medicine doctor, which um, probably most of you know is basically a primary care doctor. And I focus most of my uh, work in uh, gay men's health and HIV over the years. but. Um, you know, probably around 2015 or so, it was very clear to my organization that, that we needed to step up our care for the transgender patient. We were, I guess, in some respects, very late to the game. Um, but uh, I, I um, kind of jumped at that opportunity because for me, um, being a, a, a primary care doctor, the, at its most basic level is helping people live the lives that they want to live with, um, uh, without any judgment and um, uh, being able to provide them with the healthcare that they need for the, for the choices that they make in their life. And, and it's, it's actually quite ironic that when you think about it, the transgender population in some respects has had such a uh, unfortunate experience with the medical profession and uh, most transgender patients have experienced 
uh, discrimination or perception of discrimination uh, as they interact with the medical profession. And yet this population, perhaps more than others, is uh, more um, uh, dependent on the medical community to lead authentic lives. So it's always, uh, I always like to start by saying to my colleagues, you know, every time you see a transgender patient in your office, you have an incredible opportunity to change that narrative. And it's really important to understand, you know, the effect that you can have on a transgender patient who's uh, seeing you in, 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 in the office. Um, and because they come with a lot of trepidation. So for me, you know, being able to uh, take care of transgender patients is very much in keeping with what I do as a doctor. And it's just that much more important, I think, for this population. Thank you for that, Barry. Um, so I am an occupational therapist, um, and I'll let people know I'm actually not a doctor, I'm just a master's of science. Um, but I have been transitioning for about 20 years, and I can attest to Dr. Eisenberg's statement about the number of barriers that traditionally have been present throughout the healthcare system. And as a trans man, there's many social barriers that exist as well that were visible throughout my transition, difficulties getting employment, uh, especially early in transition where my gender presentation did not match my gender identity. Um, I made a career shift to become an occupational therapist. Um, and it was quite disheartening for me to realize how, like the behind the scenes experience of medical communities when it comes to treating trans and non-binary individuals. Um, so I actively have sought out opportunities to be able to try to influence um, how patients are received uh, within Sutter, but also within other networks as well, knowing that it's a growing population that's recently gained access to more services through Sutter and other systems as well. Um, as being trans for me gives me kind of two lenses, I understand the provider side and some of the complexities that come from it. I also have the lived experience of being a patient and trying to navigate care from the beginning of my transition to where I currently am and knowing that there's a lot of gaps in knowledge um, in all levels of service of how to actually handle someone like me or a friend of mine or a patient of mine when we show up in office. Thank you both and, and welcome. We are so happy to have both of you here today and be able to speak on this topic. We have a, a wide range of individuals joining us here today, but in general, let's talk about how anyone here that's joining us can create that safe environment for someone who shares that they are exploring their gender identity and how can we support them? I'll start. Um, so I work in behavioral health and a common model that we use is a trauma-informed care model. And I think that's incredibly relevant when looking at the amount of traumas that people have existed as a trans individual. Uh, and so when you start thinking about what trauma-informed care means, the first principle is to trust that your patient knows something about themselves. And that's really important when it comes to providing trans services because a lot of the times the person is gonna show up feeling pretty confident that something is different than the gender that they're presenting. And so when someone has that courage to actually say something, I would say, I'm having some questions about my identity, or maybe I think I'm a different gender, or maybe I don't have any idea what this gender is, that person knows something about themselves. And so trusting that they have some idea of who they are is essential. So then when they say, the name I use is, again, taking that as what it is. The patient knows their name, or the friend knows their name, they're feeling pretty confident something's going on with their gender. And so I think the first step is to just validate and acknowledge the truths that are coming out of that individual's mouth instead of immediately going into questions like, 
why do you think you're trans, right? Why do I use that name when you don't appear to be that gender? And I think that's really the foundation of creating any kind of a safe part, safe encounter is the very preliminary encounters because with someone that has a trauma background, they're ex constantly assessing an environment for safety or threat. And so little things that might not seem like a big deal to someone that's not trans actually can be really powerful at conveying a message that you're either going to be a safe provider or cascade a negative experience that they've already had, whether it be from a friend or from a clinical provider. That unsafety exists. Yeah, I mean, just to follow that up, I mean, I, I always um, comment, you know, gender identity is a very, very internal uh, and intrinsic sense of self. And um, someone does not need a doctor or a therapist or a parent or a friend to uh, tell them what their gender identity is that 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 comes from within it's part of you. Um, and so uh, acknowledging that I think is really important, as Peter said, I did want to just also talk about just the, the fact that, um, you know, this is a, a an area where there is a tremendous knowledge gap among healthcare providers at all levels. Um, from the, um, the, the unlicensed you know, uh, receptionists who greet the patients right up to the MDs who treat the patients. Um, certainly when I trained, there, you know, there, were, there really wasn't any kind of formal education in this area. But even now and today, residents who come out of training, um, depending upon where they train, it's, been, it's very spotty. Um, so when people in the healthcare profession are confronted with areas that they don't know a lot about, they get uncomfortable. Um, and um, that's why for me, um, the, one of the very, very basic things that needs to happen is education at all levels in the healthcare uh, setting. Um, and, and I think you know, most of the complaints, patient complaints that we get um, happen uh, at the very beginning when patients are checking in, you know, because, because people don't have the vocabulary, they don't have the experience, they don't have the training to know um, how to answer questions, how to ask questions, how to just say, I'm sorry, basically, if they make a mistake, because we all make mistakes. Um, and, and so education, education, education is so, so important to uh, beginning to create a safe space for our patients. And then at the same time, you know, having um, visible cues that you are a welcome person in this space, whether that's signage or artwork or something of that nature that really um, validates um, the patients that are there. I know as a gay, as a gay man, you know, the first time I saw a picture of two uh, of a gay couple in my organization as part of um, an HIV awareness day, I had been working here for like 20 years. I had never seen uh, a representation of a gay couple. And that meant a lot to me when I finally saw that. So I, I know that from a, just very personally, how, how that can affect people. So I would just, you know, so those are just two small, I mean, they're not small, they're big things, but, um, uh, you know, just to add to what Peter was saying. I have one more further thing, because I liked what you said too about visibility. And I think there's ways of being overt that it's a safe environment. Um, I've had, one provider posts a sign in their lobby that says, we are working on pronouns here. So any pronoun you use, please let us know and we will update it and use that to the best of our ability. The other thing is being a queer individual. Um, when you, for some people that may be straight or maybe cisgender, you don't understand how vulnerable it might feel sometimes to be the only person in a setting. And so, when to Dr. Eisenberg's point of seeing visible representation of seeing a picture, that's a really powerful act. But also when you go into an office and you see a gender diverse employee or some kind of visibly you know, LGBT person within that office, it also leads to a sense of safety. And on the inpatient unit, I actually try to be visibly gay for my patients. And I also do make a point of letting trans people that are struggling with their trans identity know that I'm a trans person that is working on the unit and that I'm there to be a support for them. 
So if they're having problems with any kind of staff or any person in the unit around pronouns or identity that I'm willing to go be the champion for them because it's already a scary environment to be in a psychiatric setting when you might be the only trans person on the unit and not feel like there's actually anybody that's there to specifically advocate for you. So I see that as a very powerful and privileged role that I have to be able to be a kind of mediator between a patient and a staffer. Absolutely. Thank you both for sharing on that. You I just want to add also, just, you know, also in the um, exam room setting, um, which can be anxiety provoking for anyone, I think, um, you know, I, 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 I really try to start the conversation, uh, what, you know, creating a welcoming environment, but being very open-ended, uh, trying to understand what this person's goals are for today's visit, um, not to make any assumptions. I also want to, want to understand what their, what their concerns are, their fears about, about, you know, about this visit. And um, it, just, it just sets a, 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 a playing field where this person knows that, um, you know, their concerns are foremost right now. Definitely. Thank you, Barry. Um, that, that's some, some really great examples of what we can do within the walls of our healthcare settings. Um, let's talk about as family, friends, or community members, what roles do, do we have in those sense to encourage someone who is exploring or transitioning their gender identity? Um, I, I can make a comment on that. Now, I, I'm an internist and I, and I um, don't see kids, um, certainly young kids. I, I will see um, you know, maybe 16 and older, um, but, but, I, but, I, but it is very important, you know, uh, when, when gender diverse children um, are in families, um, you know, and again, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've certainly, you know, heard uh, a lot of people talk about this and talk to my colleagues. And there've been a lot of studies that, that show that, you know, it is really important um, for this child to get some validation from their family. Now, there's a lot of variation in that. But if you're, if this child is in a family that totally rejects their, their gender diversity or their gender exploration, um, the likelihood that this person is going to have, uh, you know, feelings, uh, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, all of the things that are, uh, we see a significant um, amount of in transgender patients is much, much higher. But the good news is, if a family makes just some attempt to meet their child halfway, so that could take the, the that could look like allowing the, the child to have the friends that they want over, allowing the child to dress the way they want, allowing the child to be called uh, who, who, the name that they want. And it may not have to be all of these things, but just something. And if, and, if the, and if the family can just do something, the risk of suicide ideation and a lot of these um, things can go down significantly. So that's really, really important um, for, for, for gender diverse children. I think those are all excellent suggestions. Um, what I would add on is I think the first thing to do is to just thank the person for telling you, because I think it's an act of bravery, especially early on in transition. Uh, it can also be quite challenging though when you're late into the transition. Someone like me is definitely outing myself because I'm not what they would call visibly trans. And so it does can require a certain act of bravery on me to self-disclose. But what I would say is that first thank the person the second is not to cascade any of your fears or worries onto that individual. So saying, oh, I really hope that's not for you. You're choosing a hard life or 
do you know what life is going to be for you? Because the trans person already has those worries and fears. And so it's actually creating a further barrier for the person to feel safe. And so it actually feels, you know, like a less supportive environment to lead with that. Um, then after that, I think it's really important to say that you are willing to do some work to educate yourself as an individual and not putting that burden on the trans or non-binary individual. Um, there is ample support on the internet. There are organizations that specifically work with trans youth. There are organizations for transitional age youth, specific for trans women, incarcerated women, you know, gay men, trans men. <laughs> There's lots of resources out there. And so actually taking the initiative to do the work and educate yourself. And then specifically with children, um, saying, you know, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. I have a niece that's been gender diverse and she's explored different names and different pronouns. And as a family, we've continually said, okay, what name are we at right now? What name do you want to use at school? What name do you want to use at home? What pronouns are you trying out? Do you want us to stick to one or do you want us to change them? And letting her have a choice in how we react. And so she presents a little differently when she's with the family than she does with her friends, but she's able to talk about both of those experiences and feel supported. Also knowing that the family is not gonna out her without any disclosure, you know? So I do think those are that, and just knowing it's an ongoing process. So often just asking once someone says, I'm having this identity or I feel this way, then a good question would be, would, what's the next step you're hoping for? Are you just wanting to explore this a little bit more? Are we getting close to looking for a therapist? Should we look to a doctor? You know, and those can come later, but those are kind of the questions of letting them have some say and choice in what's gonna happen in their lives. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you both. Those were some great examples that we can take with us. And I know you had mentioned, you know, not burdening the person with having to then educate you, but taking that upon yourself. And there are so many resources out there. And I just want to point out, we will include them in your follow-up email too, but we have tons of new pride resources that MHA has put out this month um, that have you know, some really great opportunities for us all to learn and grow. And so we'll include those in your follow-up email as well so that, you know, you are able to, to take that responsibility on yourself as well, in addition to that supportive role. Um, our next question I have for both of you is, um, as a family member or friend, how can you support someone who might be facing higher levels of psychological distress? bullying, discrimination, microaggressions, um, because they are transgender. I think it's really important to continually be a resource, right? And so knowing that youth these days have a very different experience than I did. When I was a teenager and started to question my identity, there were no visibly trans people and then in my teens, late teens, I met a trans woman. And at that time, trans people weren't welcome in the gay community. And the gay community was actually very mean to this woman. And that created a lot of terror for me that if the gay community didn't accept this person, then where would I fit in the world? And the world's come a long way. I mean, that's almost 25 years ago that that was my story. Um, but when you're thinking about someone that's getting bullied, one thing is to offer a support, again, not to you know place any kind of burden on them because they're not doing anything to call on the bullying. It's people that are treating the person poorly. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to help them figure out a better place to be. So some school settings are not helpful for someone to stay there. And so, there are sometimes options where people can get moved into more supportive school systems where they're not going to confront that kind of bullying. But then I also think, especially for youth, that a big part of their development uh, psychologically is through peer resourcing. So helping them find 
some kind of a peer group that supports and acknowledges and validates who they are. And that could be through like a formal, you know, trans youth group, or perhaps it's maybe at a theater program. You know, <laughs> there's a big variety of where people can find community and identity. And I think sometimes we get stuck thinking about really formal resources. And yes, they definitely have a place, but if someone's just trying to find a sense of belonging and a sense of self-worth and some sense of self-efficacy, putting them in a place where they're actually supported for being a person is really important. I think that's the thing I always want people to remember is that trans people are people, you know? And I think a lot of times people get really hung up on the idea that we're trans and sometimes they forget that we're people. And so when someone's going through bullying or they're being outcasted or they're being put down, you wanna be an ally to that person. And you also wanna figure out what's gonna help that person feel safer and better about their life. That's very wise advice, Peter. <laughs> Um, and I would just add that as a, as a provider, um, I think it is incumbent on us to know what those resources are in the community that you work in. And, um, and so I think uh, you, that's important and, and, and uh, you know, take some research you know, to have that at your fingertips um, to provide for your patients. Absolutely. Thank you both. I'm actually gonna uplift one of the questions from our chat at this moment, just because it fits well into our discussion, talking about family members and how we can be supportive. One of our um, attendees asked, how do you support a family member who has parents or siblings who are not supportive about their pronouns or identity? I think that's a really common experience for trans people. Um, as a trans person, I had to learn that I had prepared for my transition for many years before my transition became visible to others. And it required a lot of processing and noticing and accepting and learning and validating myself. When I first came out, it was not that way. My mom told me that she had three girls and that I was clearly wrong. <laughs> and uh, me and my mom ended up repairing that because she didn't know trans people. She didn't know pronouns. And there was a learning curve for her. As I became more visibly trans and she started to see people love me and date me and that I got employed, a lot of that softened, you know? And through that, you know, everyone hopes that their parents or families are going to be this awesome support, but they had their own learning curve too. They got there, which I would like trans youth to know that just because things mm -hmm. don't go well initially doesn't mean that's the final resting place with families. But the thing that really mattered to me was finding people that really did support and validate me, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was helpful to have people to talk to at that point that also were going through that struggle with their families. And so at that time I was in support groups with other trans men that were early in transition and navigating that experience of, you know, processing it with family. Um, as time went on, I didn't need those support groups anymore, but I developed a network of people that were supportive to me. And then being able to develop other competencies, you know, professional competencies where I could actually feel like I could, you know, be supported through that I had to have mentorship to be able to develop those competencies. And so having professional mentors that kept encouraging me to talk about, you know, my gender and talk about what were some of the barriers that were coming up as a way of helping develop organizations was really helpful. So um, I think having allies that are both cis and trans and non-binary, but that are willing to support through knowing that you can't change other people's minds. And I would add that um, just as there are organizations to help the transgender individual, there are organizations that can help 
the family members of the transgender individual because it's a coming out process for them as well, really. Um, and and uh, they often will need help navigating it them, themselves. And so, and so, you know, putting families uh, in uh, communication with those kinds of support groups can also be very helpful for the whole, the whole um, family dynamic. Thank you both. Um, I know we've already kind of touched on a few ways that, you know, we can make our environments more welcoming and safe for those seeking transgender care, such as, you know, having, having signage, being asked about our pronouns, being, having that visibility that we see other people like us when we're entering a space. But are there other things and, and simple things that can be done both in our communities and then also in our healthcare settings that can encourage that welcoming and safe environment? Uh, I can talk a little bit about that, particularly in the healthcare setting. Um, you know, one of the things that um, was a huge issue in, in, in medicine um, was the binary nature of the electronic medical records um, when um, they first were designed. Um, and uh, the, the problems that that caused uh, at many, many different levels in caring for patients from um, not having um, the correct uh, gender options available in the electronic medical record to having you know, uh, lab values that were, that were tied to specific genders. And, and there were, you know, it, it was just enormous amount of problems. Um, so I think there's been a lot of improvement in that area that has really um, helped um, improve the experience for patients. Um, the, the problem with, you know, using the legal name, which often is the dead name for the, for the person, was a huge issue and a huge dissatisfier. Um, and um, so a lot of work has been done to try and improve that experience. I also would, you know, I'm very sensitive to um, the physical exam aspect. Of, uh, of what happens in, 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 a, in an encounter. Um, and just to reflect on, you know, transgender people are people. They may be there for a sore throat. They may be there for back pain. They may be there for, um, you know, something that absolutely has absolutely nothing to do with their gender identity. Um, and so uh, it is not okay to examine their breasts or their, uh, genitals uh, when someone is there for a sore throat um, because you know the provider is curious about about the exam I mean that is just that is abuse and um, so so understanding you know what goes on with with uh, the exam is very important and and on the flip side you know if you have a um, if you're doing a physical exam on a trans a gender man who's had bilateral mastectomies, you do not need to do a breast exam on this person. That's gender dis very much gender dysphoric. Uh, whereas uh, a transgender female who just started on hormones and is developing breasts, you know, doing a breast exam may be very gender affirming for that person. So understanding the nuances of the exam is, is very important. Um, doing a pelvic exam on a transgender man, incredibly dysphoric. And so understanding what you can do to reduce the anxiety around that exam and, um, you know, uh, meeting the patient where they are with that. So those are, those are things that um, I really uh, feel very strongly about and really try to educate um, my colleagues about these kinds of things. Um, understanding what um, preventive care is for transgender individuals. A lot of doctors have questions about that. You know, how, how do you screen for breast cancer, you know, prostate cancer, all of these things. So, so we have answers to that and, and, and educating colleagues about this is it goes a long way just to, to really making the experience more comfortable for the patient. So yeah, I really like the idea of remembering that trans people are humans and that is something that I always try to reaffirm. And so, yeah, the medical community often gets hung up in this binary and 
it's interesting. There's like a lot of things that are done not very thoughtfully. And uh, when I think about it, um, one thing that's often not very thoughtful is just things like waiting rooms where someone might open the door and say, you know, Miss Bailey, Mr. Bailey, whatever it is. And I've had friends that haven't changed their gender markers on their driveway that are trans men with full beards. And so if you open the door and yell out, you know, Ms. his last name, he's gonna stand up because he knows you're talking to him, but the whole room looks at him like, who are you and why is that happening? And so instead you can just drop the Miss and Mr. That's actually a very easy thing to do because you don't know <laughs> and you don't know if, you know, let that go. Um, inpatient units um, have had challenges I've seen in many organizations where they don't know how to populate the patient boards because there is this challenge between a legal name and the name used by the patient. Um, it's helpful just to list the name used by the patient, knowing that that's a way of communicating to multiple levels of staff and other patients, the name that's being used. Um, then a really important thing, and I've encountered and I've talked to lots of people about this, is resistance to pronouns. And so a patient will tell you my pronouns are he, she, they, whatever they might be, and you feeling uncomfortable with those pronouns. And so it's, it could be a trans woman that doesn't look very female by your assessment. And so instead of calling her she, which is the term she uses, you'll call her they, because that fits in. But that actually is a really hurtful situation and a trans person's gonna interpret that as harassment. Because what you're telling that woman is that she's not woman enough to use that pronoun. Mm -hmm. And so, if someone tells you that that's their pronoun, that's their pronoun. And I get uptight as a trans person that I don't have a preferred pronoun. At this stage in the game, I've legally changed all my documents and gone through every who. It's not a preference, it's my legal pronoun. But to get there has taken me years of doing and I want people to know the amount of steps that I had to go through to change my name and my pronoun to get it to be reconciled with the DMV, with the university, with my licensing board. It's a lot of work. And so it's not that the trans person isn't really trans because they haven't legally changed their name or documents yet. And so that is an essential step of creating safety for them. The other thing I'll say as a trans employee about creating trans safe environments is to be consistent with how you talk about trans people patient facing and behind closed doors, because you do not know who's behind closed doors with you. It could be me and I could be trans and you may not know it. And you could say something really transphobic. It could also be a parent of somebody that has a trans child, a partner of somebody that's with a trans person. And what you're doing is creating an unsafe environment for trans people throughout the entire organization. And so I think it's really essential to not just consider the encounter that's solely between the patient or a friend, but to consider your behavior when you're talking about, you know, a, a discriminated upon class of people that are really set up with multiple challenges through education, employment, healthcare. And so I would say, just try to respond with some compassion when someone says these things. And that I and I meant commented on this before. Um, we are all going to uh, make mistakes um, with names and pronouns, um, and and it's okay to make a mistake. And the the response is just to apologize, and not to apologize and say, "Oh, I'm sorry," but you know, it, this is so confusing. I can never keep it straight. Just, I'm sorry. I I, I made a mistake. You know, and that's okay. <laughs> Um, because we're all we're all human and we all make mistakes. Um, and I also wanted just to follow up on Peter's um, comments about pronouns. You know, I think this is just my personal um, reflection. Um, the first time that I had to introduce myself with pronouns um, was as a cisgendered man. I it was weird. 
you know, it was it was weird to say I, I, I I'm Barry, he he him, because um, I'd never had to do that in my life ever before, and it real and I realized wow that's a really privileged place to be in life, with regards to gender, and it 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 just kind of brought it home like for transgender individuals they have to do that every day of their life with every interaction with every person and um so to to start you know using pronouns as a cisgender man and and it, it doesn't show here but you know usually on my zoom you know I, I will have my pronoun every in every interaction that i do electronically i have my pronouns and it's because I want to take that away. I want to. I want to take that burden away from transgender people because I, re I realize just how privileged cisgender people are with that. And um, so it was just just a, a, a personal reflection uh, about the whole pronoun thing because sometimes trans cisgender people don't get it. You know, they don't understand why we're saying pronouns, and and that's why. Absolutely. Thank you for that perspective, Barry. Our next question I have for the both of you, um, knowing that being transgender itself is in no way a mental health issue, but a lot of individuals who are transitioning or struggling with gender identity do also struggle with mental health conditions. They're going through a large life change that can increase the challenges they're facing every day. So what can someone do to support their own mental health while they're transitioning and then after transition? Yeah, I think there's a lot of stress that comes around transition. And I think it's an ongoing stress. Um, and so when you first transition, there's a lot of stress that happens just when you initiate any kind of a change, whether that change be a change in the way you dress, the pronouns you're using, the name you use, or if you initiate hormones or some kind of intervention. There is a constant change where the person is learning to accept themselves and work with some changes that are happening in a lot of different ways. There's changes with mood that happen, you know, there's changes with appearance, body type, all sorts, sleep, you know, body smells, it's a lot of change. And so that in itself creates a lot of stress. And so when I say working with people that have mental health is one is come up with some regular habits and routines because anything that's predictable for you is gonna lower the amount of stress that you experience. There should be some amount of support around you. That's, um, so if it's friends, great. If it's providers, great. When you're looking for providers though, it's essential to find people that are knowledgeable competent and kind towards trans people and really build a supportive army around you. You know, all of my providers are trans competent, my PCP, you know, any specialty that I go to, I go to great lengths knowing that they know someone like me is going to show up. Um, so building that network and same if you're finding a therapist or a psychiatrist, again, making sure that they understand gender diversity and that they're on board to do it um, are essential to be able to do it because you have to reduce the stress. As a trans person, I had to develop coping strategies um, to just manage like daily things like Early in my transition, it seemed like people wanted to ma'am me more than anything. Thanks, ma'am. Go to the end of the line, ma'am. And so anytime someone would say ma'am to me, I would say, oh, they're just saying man. And I just changed it. And so that I wouldn't get so angry at it because it kept happening. And so it, for me, I had to come up with different ways of coping with a number of different microaggressions that people would have. And I would also just add, you know, basic self-care, you know, getting enough sleep, getting exercise, eating correctly. Um, all those are really important, particularly, you know, the, the, the hormonal therapy can sometimes cause a significant amount of weight gain. And um, so all those things I think are, are, are important. And 
Um, I think it's helpful, you know, if uh, knowing the resources in the community, you know, that a, a transgender patient person might feel more comfortable going to, like a, a gym that might be more welcoming for transgender people than some others, um, and things like that, that I think can also help with the whole stress of transitioning. Absolutely. Our last question that I have for the both of you before we move on to audience questions is what should healthcare providers do to expand access and resources for the non-binary and transgender community? If there's anything that either of you are doing with, with Sutter um, at the moment, we would love to hear about that as well. Well, we are always um, trying to educate um, providers uh, on this topic. Um, at two different levels. One is just at a basic uh, knowledge level and sensitivity level to the transgender patient, but at the same time also trying to identify providers who might want to learn more about um, working with transgender patients and, and educating them uh, so that they feel comfortable um, doing that kind of work and that might mean having them shadow you um, and learning that way. We have scholarship programs to help them pay for um, education sessions or conferences. Um, you know, so just we're always trying to um, get more people, more providers interested in doing the work because there is definitely a, a shortage of people doing this work, particularly in mental health. Uh, and as there is throughout, you know, in mental health everywhere, but, um, and in um, pediatrics, those are the, 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 I would say that the two areas in our organization that really have um, the most shortages right now. Um, so really trying to, you know, and at the recruitment level, trying to recruit uh, physicians that have an interest in, the, in that area that can expand our, um, our resources for the non-binary and trans gender patient. We also have um, a gender care advocate who um, is uh, really tied into um, our system and the resources uh, in the Bay Area. And when I say resources, I mean anything from, you know, um, uh, stores that uh, cater to hair, uh, makeup, clothing, gyms, faith-based organizations, anything, you know, sports organizations that um, they, we can um, point transgender non-binary patients to um, so, you know, they can um, really, you know, begin their transition. It, you know, a transition obviously is much more than taking medications. Um, it's, 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 it's everything. And um, as a physician, um, I, you know, don't necessarily have the, you know, the reach into that er those areas. But we now, but we do have a, you know, a gender care advocate that can help um, reach into those areas and and help these patients find um, the, the groups that they need to do. And I think that's so so important. We're also going to be starting a more in depth uh, program that to helps with to help with the non medical aspects of transitioning um, that that are, happen outside you know, the doctor's office. Yeah, I think for myself, I have kind of a different role. And so um, working as an educator, I've done a lot of work with San Jose State to try to increase just awareness of uh, gender diverse individuals that OTs might encounter uh, in healthcare settings and also have done a little bit of support with the nursing program through San Jose State as well. Um, for me, it's really important to learn about resources that are available. And so a big part of what I do is to try to learn what are the resources in the greater Bay Area and develop personal connections with those programs as a way of kind of gaining knowledge about what is available, what is changing, um, figuring out how to support different organizations that are trying to do more trans inclusion or non-binary inclusion, any kind of gender diversity. Um, uh, and 
For me, it is just staying connected to resources. Often for trans patients, um, I do ask if they need help finding specific resources. And I do talk about that there are options in the Bay Area about clothing closets, um, shelters, programs for people that were incarcerated, substance abuse programs, churches that are you know inclusive because at the end of the day, we're all just trying to figure out where we fit in and belong. And so as a healthcare provider that does the less medical side and focuses on people figuring out how to be more supported within themselves, it is figuring out how to get them access to the places they'll go. I've also tried to do some education with multiple levels of staff, just knowing that you have to consider the whole person. And so if you're sending a trans person where they're likely to be the only gender diverse person in a recovery program, um, that might not be the best place for that person to recover. Sometimes that in itself is gonna be a barrier for the person feeling safe. Absolutely, thank you, Peter. We had a question in the chat too for you, Barry. If you could um, repeat the, the the part about the gender advocate that you have at your organization and what the role of that individual has in practice. Yeah, so this is um, this is uh, an individual um, who um, again works as I would say as an extension to the providers that are are seeing patients. And anytime we get a new referral to our program, um, that uh, the, the new patient is asked, you know, do you want to also speak to the gender care advocate? And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But, um, but the gender care advocate, um, you know, everyone's transition is different. There's no one standard way to do this. And so um, we have to be flexible in, in, in what our patients need and want. And um, so the gender care advocate again has, ha, you know, is really up to date with all of the resources in our geographic area that they can help point the patient to. Um, so as I mentioned, if you know, is, if someone is looking for a faith-based organization that is trans friendly, you know, the, the transgender advocate can help them with that. If someone is having, just the other day, um, you, you know, had a lot of questions about binding uh, their breasts and problems they were having with that. And um, uh, I actually was not able to answer um, their questions to, you know, in a way that I thought was helpful. <laughs> um, and the gender care advocate was much more experienced with some of these uh, issues. And I was able to get them in touch with this person and, and, and help them answer their questions that they were having about, about binding. Um, and, and so it's a real, um, it's real easy for me to communicate with the gender care advocate through our, our system. And it really creates um, opportunities for the, for the whole transition and to really individualize the journey that this person may be taking because there's no standard way to do this. Absolutely, that sounds like a great role and position that you have in your facility. And we actually have two, we have two gender care advocates in our system right now. So, and they work together really well, so. Wonderful. Um, one more question, if you can answer it in three parts. Um, one more have for you. It appears that you have experience working with Hispanic transgender men or women and overcoming the Spanish language barrier in regards to pronouns as well as resources specifically for that community. Um, Jackie, you, your, your sound kind of oh, went for some of I, that. So I heard the end of it. Um, yeah, I'm not I, sure I heard. I'll repeat one more time. Um, we had a question from the audience. Um, if either of you have experience working with Hispanic transgender men or women and how to overcome the Spanish language barrier in regards to pronouns as well as any resources you could provide. I can't think of the name of the organization off the top of my head, but there's a very strong group of trans women primarily um, in San Francisco that is specifically organizing um, to support trans uh, 
you know, Latinx um, people. And what I'll say is there is a lot of diversity. One of my exes was, uh, was Mexican and a Spanish speaker. And just like we're doing with experimenting with pronouns and having, you know, he, she, they, them, that's like the starter pack. But then there's like an expansion pack where the people might use like Zzer, there's all sorts. And it's an opportunity to learn but when you are working with that community, I always would say lean into the same truths and ask some basic questions. What are the pronouns you're using? How can I be a support? I'm here for you as a resource and to come at it from an angle of listening. But if you wanna Google trans women organization, San Francisco, I'm pretty certain you'll find that organization quickly. Thank you, Peter. I know a few people are adding some resources in the chat as well. So thank you all for sharing your knowledge on that one. Um, and we are gonna wrap up there. I know we're coming to the end of our hour. Thank you both Barry and Peter so much for your knowledge that you have shared with us in this last hour. It's been really great. And I appreciate everyone in the chat who has been sharing resources and thoughts as well. Um, we will be in touch with all of you very soon. Um, by the end of the week, we'll have sent out a follow-up email. It'll have the recording to this that you can share. It'll also have that link to request your certificate of attendance and some other resources that we'll include in there. So thank you both. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day and week and happy end of Pride Month. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. You it was a pleasure to take part in this. And yeah, happy Pride, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you both. Have a great day, everyone.